Hi, this is Victoria Nolle and here with me again is Professor Peter Cameron. As I mentioned in my first video, he is the director of the Center for Energy, Petroleum, Mineral and Policy. In our first video, he gave advice to the students who would like to undertake their master's studies in energy law. And in this video, we're going to focus on PhD students. But before we start, I would like Professor Cameron to briefly introduce himself again. Thank you, Victoria. I'm very happy to, to do that. I, I'm an academic. I'm, a, I'm a, an academic a, and an author. I write various books. I, I love writing books. It's one of my, one of my passions. Um, and in the past, over, over a number of years, I've been invited by various governments to give them advice, and I've usually done that, uh, funded by, by, say, the World Bank or sometimes the Norwegian government, actually. But now I've moved into more uh, areas uh, to do with investment um, and investment protection. And so I'm sitting as, a, as an arbitrator um, in the, uh, in the, uh, with the ICSID, the International Center for Settlement of Investment Disputes, which is based in Washington, D.C. So it's great fun. I'm enjoying it very much. Uh, thank you, Professor Cameron. And as I mentioned in my last video, he has been supervising me since 2013. So definitely you need to hear from him. And uh, so in this second video, in the first one, you give advice to the master's students. In this one, we want to focus on PhD students. What are the key things to consider when undertaking a PhD in energy studies? Well, I think, Victoria, the first one is definition of the topic. Yes. And this is um, enormously important. And it's actually quite challenging. Usually you find people pick a topic and they have to refine it quite a lot in the first year. So they, they pick a topic, they get accepted, they start work, and then they find that, that the work reveals some problems with the topic. Maybe it's too broad. Maybe you need some materials which are too difficult to, to get your hands on. You didn't know that. So you've got to try and refine it. Usually it involves narrowing it down. At the worst, you might have to change your topic. There's no need to panic, but if you, if you have to do that, face up to it and make a switch as fast as you can. So I, I'd say that's, that's the biggest challenge. And a risk, I would say, is don't choose something which is topical. Like it, the media are discussing something. And you think, well, I'm going to do this because it's really important. Yes, sure, if, if, it, if you can finish it today, but you can't. It's going to take you three or four years. By that time, it might not be topical. So I would be saying avoid topicality and try and think long term. It's not, not very easy, but try and define something which you think will be useful even four years from now. Thank you very much, Professor Cameron. And um, you've, you've supervised many students, including yes. myself. So the second question is, what do PhD supervisors expect from their students? Well, what do they expect? I think they expect a lot of dedication. I mean, this is not, this is like doing a marathon, a run. It's 26 miles. It's, a, it's the academic equivalent of a marathon. It's a, it, so you need, in addition to your intelligence, you need, you need stamina. So, and, and you need also a sense, this matters for me. And your supervisor is is in a relationship to you that, that actually is, is different from the master's one because that supervisor becomes quite close to you as you develop and you grow over the three year period. The supervisor is there initially as a teacher, but actually quite quickly you will learn more about your topic than your supervisor. That's nothing, nothing wrong with that, but the relationship will change. Then he or she has to try and help you move towards a successful completion of, of your thesis. So it's, it's a, there are dynamics inside the relationship. Thank you very much. So the key, issue, uh, the key issue here is the student has to be passionate about the topic and also you have to be dedicated. You definitely have to give the PhD all your time. And then the last question with regard to PhD students is, 
how do they prepare for their viva? Because you've, you've, uh, you've been an ex external examiner for many students. So what do external examiners expect from students, from PhD candidates, especially during the viva? That's, that's a really good question. The viva is so important. Often when you finish the text, you've done something which maybe argues in a certain way that's new. Uh, you think it's right, but you have to convince other people it's right. Your examiner may read it and may think, well, I'm not sure if this is right. I don't know if I agree, or maybe there are some mistakes. Um, on a big project like that, that's, that doesn't matter too much. You, you'll have to correct the mistakes. But the key thing is, in the Viva, you have to convince the, the ex examining board, especially the external, that you are really on top of this. Maybe you cited something slightly wrongly, it doesn't matter. Is your argument a really good one? And so the examiner will be testing you. So, did you write this yourself? Obvious question. You have to convince the examiner it was my work and I think it was right. And that argument that I pursued is one that you should believe is a good one. You don't have to accept it, but you have to believe that it's a really good one and it's a contribution to knowledge. Um, so that I've said to people when they're preparing for a viva, don't give an inch. When you're making that argument, make sure that you've convinced the panel that you really have done something very well. And it's amazing how many people get through the viva successfully because they persuade the, the well, basically the committee that, that what they've done is something really, really good. But it can make such an important difference to get the presentation right and believe in yourself, believe in what you've achieved, as you did. Thank you very much, Professor Cameron. Uh, that marks the end of our second video. And the next series will be focusing on decommissioning local content and challenges energy investors face. Stay tuned. Thank, Thank you, you, Professor Cameron. Thank you.